Community supported shelters started out of a need. Uh, during Occupy, somebody called us up because they knew that we were micro shelter geeks and they said, we need a shelter that we can bring down here for a single woman with a child who can't get warm. And this is when Occupy was down uh, in between Washington and Jefferson. So we said, okay, sure, this sounds like a fun opportunity. And it was a trip setting up a structure like right down the middle of Eugene, cars going by and we kept kind of looking around, me and my friend Micah, like, is this okay? Or like, we're good here? And we set up the whole structure without, a, without an ounce of issue. And uh, that gave birth to the Conestoga Hut. At that time, the Conestoga Hut was very uh, simple, rudimentary structure. And since then, it's evolved to, to fill the need better. So it wasn't us sitting around thinking like, oh, how could we help humanity? Or, like, that's obvious that humanity needs a lot of help right now. And we were just there to kind of play around with the need. You know? So that's sort of been uh, a big part of our MO is what's the need, how can we fill it right now? So we started building Conestoga huts and since we started, we've built 37 Conestoga huts in Eugene Springfield area. It's pretty good right now. And during that time, people kept coming to us, to our office. We were just building them. We weren't actually getting people in there. That's St. Vinny's job. But people would see our hut out front and they'd say, how do I get into one of those? And we, got, we kept saying this same phrase over and over again. Go down to St. Vinny's and get on the waiting list. And I remember one time when I was so depressed, saying it over and over again. I was like, this is really getting hard to like tell people to go get on a list that we know is not moving. Then the city said something about um, rest stop camps. So we jumped on that. Okay, here's the next way we can fill this need. We can, instead of just saying, go get on a waiting list, say, okay, we have a camp, a temporary place for you to sleep while you try to maybe get in a Conestoga hut, or are on the waiting list for your disability, or whatever your situation is. And we say, okay, here's, here's the next step for us. And then we uh, opened up the first camp, December 2013, um, on Roosevelt Carfield. And then in March, we opened up the Veterans Camp at Northwest Expressway in Chambers. So that's, that's sort of our, our main project right now, is, is those camps, learning about how we're going to operate them, how we're going to fund them, and uh, opening up more camps in the future when the opportunity uh, shows itself. Let's turn the slide. So <coughs> this whole time, we haven't really thought through much of this. It's sort of on the fly. <laughs> but now, into our, about our a year and a half of operating, we're like, okay, let's, let's talk about what are we doing? What, why does this seem to be working? Why are we getting positive response from the community? And we've identified right now these three key aspects to what we're doing. First, and, and they're in order of priority. Here, they're in order of priority. The flyer didn't get that kind of priority, so that's sort of... He got on the flyer. We realized afterwards, oh wait, there's a priority here. So first, provide shelter, which we can do a little bit more simply, simply now through the camps. But now I'm telling people, no, you have to be on our waiting list, which <coughs> sucks. <laughs> and that's what I have to tell people now. I have people calling me every day, is there a space yet? Is there a space yet? And I keep saying, just keep checking back in. Because it's those that are diligent who eventually do get in. Then the next is uh, building community, which I'll go into later, and accessing support. I'm going to just hop into what this all means right now. So first off, providing shelter. I'm saying it over and over again. The camps are, we feel, the easiest way to provide quick and immediate shelter that's needed now. Each camp takes roughly four to $5,000 to set up, and the uh, infrastructure on site is about $250 a month. So that gets something done very quickly, and it gets 15 people housed. For 15 people, we only have two porta potties, and that's just, that's just like St. Vincent de Paul's car camping program, except when they have two porta potties, they're only serving six people at max. So already, 
we've, we we're finding a way to be more efficient. And um, they're easy to set up and take down, they, it, and it provides an opportunity for community development and individual retreat in a structure to manage environment. It's a very important thing to have that balance, because you can be too isolated, or you could be in, in the same space with a lot of people to the point where it makes you crazy because you, don't have, you haven't had your retreat time. I mean, we could imagine us sitting here. I mean, maybe, what if we were here all year together? All of our shit would come out. <laughs> and we'd be working through stuff we never even knew existed. Um, so providing an opportunity to get some of that community development, which is very important to uh, people's well-being. Can you bring it back? Just hit the other button. Here. Oh. It's just, you hit this. To, to empowering people, to, uh, to help people actually get into housing, you know, and not feeling defeated the whole way there. Uh, our, pri our priority is shelter. Notice we use the word shelter, we didn't use housing. Because we feel there's a lot that can be done to influence people positively without a house. All you need is a basic form of shelter. And it can make a lot of difference in somebody's life. One of our campers told me that, she, she's been homeless for three years, she told me that this is the safest place that she's felt in her whole time being homeless, and she was living with friends, and you know had the ability to be in a house, but she feels safer just with a tent and a cover over it. Um, maybe, maybe a little less safe right now, because we took the covers off, but. That's for good reason, uh, so the UV doesn't kill them, so we have them for another year. And the camps can be upgraded over time. It's kind of like there's a basic platform. I mean, we could, we could work with just a piece of land, just put some tents on the ground, and over time, when we have the finances, put in platforms to raise them up off the ground, step by step, and develop them into you know, livable camps to serve the you know, most number of people possible. And, and like I said, they're inexpensive to maintain. Uh, the campers in our camps do a lot of the work themselves uh, to maintain the property, mow the grass, do any weed eating, you know, fixing of um, whatever it is that they need. You know, they're, they've got it in them to figure out how to, to make it livable for them. You know, they, they don't need somebody else being paid enough of a wage to pay their mortgage to be able to do that for themselves. So we save a lot of money in that way. It's just providing a platform for people to uh, meet their own needs. And just to give people a, uh, a quick snapshot, snapshot of the Eugene Safe Spot Camp, um, the reason we have this statistic is because uh, there's some people out there, I don't think it's any of you guys here, that think that these are just people coming from out of state to take advantage of the services and the kindness that you, the Eugene community has to offer. Uh, these statistics are taken, they were taken about a month, a month ago. They've changed, but it's still pretty accurate. That uh, the, the seven people have been living in Eugene for 20 to 40 years. Uh, and that's almost half the camp. So our organization doesn't necessarily uh, discriminate against people that come from out of town because it's a historic phenomenon that people, if something's not going well in one city, they go to the next and they go from word of mouth and they go from what they hear. <laughs> to, to demonize these people as bad is also part of that historical makeup. Is uh, like during the Dust Bowl, I was talking to somebody, I don't, they might be in this room, recently about during the Dust Bowl, uh, a, a lot of people who, who uh, faced that hardship moved to California and they were demonized by the people living there and blamed for all the problems. 
So knowing that, we should be able to act differently, you know, but we do repeat our problems, you know, over and over again. Um, but I believe that we can rise above, above that as a community. Maybe if more of the community was here, we could. <laughs> but the work is great and the workers are few, so I'm glad some people are here. Um, next slide. So building community is, is essential for the success of these camps. It's, um, we build community with, with people on the streets and uh, they serve lots of important purposes in our camps. That's community building. Uh, we build community with people who are in houses who care and that all connects together to make a cohesive community. So it's not just giving a platform for people in the camps to uh, work um, amongst themselves to meet their own needs. It's also building community so the social services aren't overwhelmed with this responsibility. It really is a, a responsibility of the community to, to handle this issue. Without, if we don't involve the community, we don't have, we don't have a solution. Because the solution does not rest in, truly the, the, the solution does not rest in, 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 in big grants and stuff. Big grants can help, but it's going to take a little, uh, uh, everybody giving a little is going to be more effective than probably the biggest grant you can get. Uh, next slide. Uh, to feature one of the ways that we're building community and, and helping to address the um, sort of the stigma that exists in the in the community of the homeless is to be out there doing work in the community. Uh, two weeks ago, the veterans camp uh, worked in uh, Skinner View Park and mulched 134 trees that were also planted by volunteers. And this is work that would have been very hard to accomplish otherwise. I mean, it was work that might not have actually gotten done. Uh, and those trees might have passed away, you know. So just that small instance shows that no matter who you are, you can serve a purpose in this community. And, and that's something that we emphasize a lot to people is uh, an important part of of changing the perception of homelessness is to show, to show that there's an opportunity there for community inclusion, purpose, empowerment of people who don't have jobs, you know? Their jobs can become something different. Um, so, is anybody interested in how these, the program works? Let me just get a, a, how the program works. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, I didn't see enough. Okay, because a lot of you guys already know. I saw, I saw, I saw a lot. You saw a lot? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see some hands. Come on, raise them high. Yeah. Okay. We'll 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 talk about them. Okay. <laughs> so, um, we have a very limited paid staff, and we don't get paid that much. There's two people on our payroll. We don't get paid. Sometimes I don't even get paid. Um, but uh, that's another. Uh, we, once a week, uh, one of the camps goes out on Wednesday and uh, goes, uh, we get together with the city of Eugene and they, they choose the project. They, they kind of facilitate it, they bring their tools and their truck and even some refreshments and we have a good time. Uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing is evasive, uh, invasive uh, weed removal. Am I saying that right? I always say evasive weed. That means it's a weed that got away. Yeah. <laughs> it's not impressive. Um, and then we're also getting into general maintenance. Uh, we painted some lampposts in Skinner View Park. Uh, you guys all know the whale yeah. playground? Yeah. 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 We painted the whale. <laughs> Who helped with that project in this room? All right. Yeah. yeah. The other camp was working on doing the weed removal from Amazon Park, and those weeds have been there for two and a half years before somebody had touched them. Two and a half years. They, 
they only have two paid staff to take care of both Amazon um, Park and they have another two paid staff to take care of Skinner Butte Park. When we called the city, they were like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And they love, they love it, they love it. And we get a lot done with that many hands. And, and it's a way to build community too amongst the campers and then also the outside community sees that. And they're like, wow, what's going on here? They ask questions and we tell them. And so we're ch slowly, you know, these kinds of changes, changes of perception happen very slowly. And that's, and that's what we're doing. Just one weed at a time. <laughs> that's, that's a metaphor. <laughs> um, and, and there's something about people, I know myself, because uh, I, I go out on all these uh, work parties, getting your hands in a certain area, touching the earth, wherever it is, or a thing, you all of a sudden, you know, you have a connection to that thing. So it's, it's a way to create community pride amongst the people who also live in the camps and take some ownership over the community. Um, uh, next slide. So accessing support is the third step of our, of our MO. And up here, you know, I see a lot of y'all looking at the slides. You see social organizations. That's important. It is important because we all have to work together. And there's a lot of social organizations doing a lot of good things. And uh, we love working with them. It also means accessing support in other ways beyond the social services. It's accessing the uh, community of caring people. Um, one, one way that we're doing that, you know, I, I can only give you individual stories of, of individual people, but there's a, one of our campers who, you know, he's been a worker his whole life. He wants to work. He wants to make his own money. I tried to give him money once, and he said, no, I, I, ha I have to earn the money. <laughs> and uh, so he found something that needed to be done somewhere else. He got paid for it, and he went out and bought his uh, window squeegee. And he's slowly building up the supplies to be able to go around and offer himself to wash windows. And so that's another way of accessing support. You know, he didn't go to a social service. He, he went to the community. So. There's almost an endless amount of possibilities how you can access support in the community. And every time that you do, you build this web that we're creating, the community network, community safety net, for everybody to get their needs met, no matter how big or small. Um, but, uh, so it says networking with others in the community and existing social services to help people move toward their goals for improving their life. We didn't say housing, because you can't improve your life without housing. There's ways that you can feel better about yourself. There's ways that you can create skills and have those skills actually empower you to make some other steps. Because there's this, this kind of a blueprint that, uh, at least, I mean, I, I kind of see it and I, I work with it for myself, is Small steps in the right direction are a lot better than one giant fall in the other direction. Yeah. So housing can, is right now in this day and age, it's a big step. And I see it because I got people calling day and night wanting to get a camping spot that's safe. It's not housing, if they want just a safe place, place to camp. I don't know how many $200 tickets I've seen that people hold on to, you know. Um, Okay, I won't go on a rant though. That's, that could be a rant. Uh, no, yeah, we got time. We got time restraints here. Nobody's actually even tracking my time. <laughs> I'm about 20, so I gotta wrap it up. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a really good point, but it's gone. So, uh, but we love these guys too, these social organizations. I think. Everybody raise your hand who's from one of these organizations. <clears throat> so, yeah, here we are. The, the, the work is great and the workers are few. Um, next slide. Here, here's the biggest, I think, thing that we're working with is, uh, so Shelter Care recently lost some funding for their Royal Avenue program. St. Vincent de Paul lost their funding for expanding the car camping program. So 
The need is still growing, but the resources are shrinking. As a community, we need to get real creative on creating some alternatives, or we're going to have a big mess on our hands. And that's more, we, our organization doesn't have the answers to that, but we know that the conversation needs to happen. That's, I think, the, 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 the challenging part of all this, because things, are, things appear to be getting, um, I mean, we see small successes, but things are getting worse for a lot of people. Uh, just before I, I came here, uh, I mean, I get calls like this all the time where somebody is losing their house on September 1st and they need, to, they need a place to be. They don't know where they're going on September 1st, and that's a, it's a stressful thing. Also, to have to look at every day, you know, get those phone calls and just say, you know, I don't, I don't have anything. But, you know, we do, we do what we can, you know. Um, yeah, so we need alternatives and we need them now. Um, and we're going to have to work as a community to find out what those alternatives are. Uh, it's not going to, you know, the people who are going to care the most are the people who are on the ground. And we need to start working together on the ground to create those alternatives.